Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Paul Layden, and I'm one of the conference coordinators here at Colorado State University, along with Emily LeBlanc. I'm going to introduce our next plenary speaker here in just a moment. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to give folks a brief introduction of uh, who I am here at CSU. So I am, an, a, I am a master instructor, and so I teach our event planning class. I also teach a pre-internship class, and I coordinate uh, internships for all of our undergraduate students here in the Department of Human Dimensions and Natural Resources. So now I'd like to introduce our plenary, next plenary speaker. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Grace, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, Grace Petita Williamson is the National Recreation and Tourism Coordinator with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Marine Sanctuary System. Utilizing her 25 years in the conservation sector, Grace works with the outdoor recreation and tourism industry sectors to strategically engage them to national marine sanctuaries, also known as blue parks, through shared values. Recently, she introduced a destination stewardship approach to advance protection of NOAA's resources while fostering sustainable economic growth in communities adjacent to sanctuaries. Grace is a strong advocate for a federal interagency coordinated approach to strengthen local resource allocation and decrease stakeholder fatigue. Prior to joining NOAA, she specialized as a bird and wetland biologist with the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Canadian Wildlife Service, and Ducks Unlimited. In recognition of her conservation efforts, she was selected as a National Conservation Leadership Institute Fellow. As an avid bird watcher, kayaker, gardener, travel enthusiast, and mom of twins, Grace and her family are naturally active outdoors. Grace invites you to join her in celebrating the National Marine Sanctuary System's 50th anniversary. And Grace, I just want to say that uh, I myself have been to a couple of the uh, National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, particularly the one that was most interesting was uh, that the one that's in uh, Alpena, Michigan. Oh, Thunder Bay. I knew you were going to say that. Everybody always says that's an interesting yeah. one. Well, my, my mother lives in that part of the state and she said, yeah, there's this museum place right. and shipwrecks. And I that's said, awesome. yeah, that's, cool. <laughs> that's and fantastic. Have a cousin who's, a, who's a boat captain on Maui. So I've been out there before as well. So yeah. Yeah, I, so, I, that's fantastic. Yes. Well, Grace, welcome. We're so glad to have you here today, uh, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. So, Grace, take it away. All right. So, let's see. Am I able to? I don't see the share video All right, on let's here. Let's see if we can get that. Emily, are you able to get that for her? It should be on now. Sorry about that, Grace. That's okay. That's okay. It's, you know, all right, let me try to blow this up. So I'm on my laptop, which is, ah, there it is, perfect. Okay, and how do I share? Trying to get to the right window. Okay. Hmm. Ah, perfect, okay, sorry. I'm, so, I'm used to having three screens <laughs> at my house. So this is, doing it a laptop in my hotel room is very, very interesting, but we will, we will go from there. Okay, so can you guys see the respect, protect, and enjoy? Yes, that looks great. And it went away for just a second. Let's see if it comes it back. Did. Oh, well, that's not good. All right. I'm screen sharing, but yet it moved. I'm trying to juggle. All right, I'm going to stop sharing and try it again because it was there. Okay. I'm ready to go. <sighs> My apologies. Um, okay. I hope to open that up again. And I might just have to wing it without my notes because it doesn't seem like I can do both at the same time. So I apologize for things, but in the meantime, as I'm trying to do this, because I generally juggle multiple hats, I am generally based in the Washington DC general area. Today, I am in a hotel in Boulder, Colorado. I've been part of a Leave No Trace um, board meeting for strategic planning, and it's been a Great opportunity. All right, let's see if this works. Um, presenter view. And I'm going to share again. Sorry, I'm talking to myself. Why is this not? It's not liking me for some reason. All right, I had this all set. Let's try this again. Okay, how about that? We back in business? It's says it's starting, but it's not quite there yet. 
Okay. There it is. Okay. We can. All see right. It. I'm just going to wing it. So I apologize. I will try to stay on task <laughs> and just go from there because my notes are gone. So um, thank you. I am Grace Petunia Williamson. I am so happy to be here. Um, Thank you for the introduction. So yes, I am, I've been in conservation world generally as I started off as a bird biologist. Um, definitely outside is, is the way I love to live my life. Unfortunately, as I said, I, said, I, walk, I work in the Washington DC area. So those opportunities are few and far, far between, but the intersection of conservation, resource protection and connecting people to any place, whether it's a national marine sanctuary, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, through messaging, through opportunity, can making sure people understand what's out there and what's so important to protect and using recreation and tourism as that opportunity, not only to engage people and get them excited, but also it, it really is a critical tool for resource protection. So, okay, so I mentioned that I was part of a Leave No Trace conversation and for folks that may be calling in from inter globally, I, you know, hopefully you've heard that because Leave No Trace has it's an organization, but it's also a messaging campaign too. And it's a, a fantastic organization. But just as it happened um, yesterday morning at like 5 a.m. mountain time for the United States, I was part of a high level, I'm trying to see if I can get this right without my notes. It's a high level panel on a sustainable ocean economy. So a very global conversation. Um, and some of the things that came out of that yesterday, which was just super timely, was you know sustainable, regenerative and resilient tourism can lay the found work the foundation for healthy, mutually beneficial community and ocean economy. The tourism industry, government, communities, et cetera, really need to work together. And that's the great thing about recreation and tourism, right? Connecting people to places and getting to understand why such healthy systems are important. And tourism, tourists can be the ages of change. So I say this because while I'm talking about ocean, it really is anywhere, special places at large. So this is the National Marine Sanctuary System. We are based in the United States. I work for the federal government. I work under the Department of Commerce, which is a surprise to most folks, including myself. Um, our, if you're familiar with national parks or Fish and Wildlife Service, that's Department of Interior. We are Department of Commerce. And it's a really grab bag, huge agency. But this is what we look like in, you know, just on the map. It's our family photo, we call it. So from all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast, through Hawaii and America and Samoa, we have 15 national marine sanctuaries and two uh, marine national monuments that we co-manage. One in Hawaii, Papahanaumokuakea, Kea, and the other one in America and Samoa, Rose Atoll. So 620,000 square miles is within the national marine sanctuary system. And if you put not the marine, uh, the marine national monuments, but if you put the national the waters within national marine sanctuaries together collectively 98% of those waters are open to compatible use, meaning opportunities, activities that are compatible to resource protection, which is our mission. That includes recreation and tourism. So um, on the map, you'll see the circles are our existing national marine sanctuaries and are the ones that are in yellow squares, if you can see those colors, are ones that are, have been proposed as national marine sanctuaries and we're beginning the designation process. So it's a different conversation. If you're interested on how a national marine sanctuary actually becomes, is selected as a national marine sanctuary, it is a very community-based project process. And I'm happy to talk about it anytime, but not within the confines of this. Um, other things to note, I mentioned, you know, we're called, we like to consider ourselves blue parks. We're very similar, again, to the mission of the National Park Service or many parks in general protected areas. Our mission is to protect and conserve natural and cultural resources, natural for us in the ocean and Great Lakes. Um, so that's that marine definition. So natural for us are coral reefs, eelgrass, humpback whales, sharks, seabirds, etc. cetera, um, jellyfish, stingrays, but also cultural. So cultural and cultural heritage. So shipwrecks. Um, we have our very first national marine sanctuary that was created 50 years ago. Um, and our anniversary is just on Sunday. So about 50 years ago is the USS Monitor, which is a Civil War shipwreck. Um, all the way to, you know, all different kinds of shipwrecks, including in Thunder Bay, as you mentioned, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan, um, to natural habitats. So humpback whale, Hawaiian Island humpback whale is for humpback whale habitat. And then most of our sites are really a combination of, of everything, both natural and, and cultural heritage. And in many cases, these waterways were also opportunities for 
um, nomadic tribes. And so some of our sites like Olympic Coast National Mean Sanctuary, we have co-trustees co with the Macaw and I believe it's the Ho Tribal Nations. So there's lots of conversations, very similar national parks and that mission of protection, except we're in the water. And it means a lot of different things to be in a place where it is just managing water. We do not manage points of entry. So during the last couple of years when most land places were closed, the waters were always open, but getting into those waters, that was the tricky point. That's not something we manage. So being managing water, that also means that it's porous borders. So there's no single point of entry, which also means it's free, which is fantastic because ocean recreation itself is free. Oh, excuse me, it's not free, it's very expensive. Um, but because we manage water and there's no single point of entry, you know, one, the fee of visitor fees and be able to attract money, but it's also that single point of entry of connecting with visitors, users that come into the National Meat Sanctuaries. We don't have that. Um, so it makes it really difficult and almost impossible at this point with our resources to count the number of people that are coming into a National Meat Sanctuary or even capture what they're doing and while they're doing it. So when you have that balance of resource protection and engaging people, we don't know what the impact is until after the fact, until it's way too severe. So managing water makes it really interesting. And we do have some visitor centers. There's a couple other tools that I'll talk about, but when you're managing you know, hundreds of miles of water right off the coast and you have one visitor center, there's no way possible that you could capture all those people. So while we've been around for 50 years, I will guess that most folks, except for, except for the gentleman who introduced me, know what a National Meat Sanctuary is. And I will tell you when I started seven years ago, even though I worked on the coast looking outward my entire career, I, I didn't know what a National Meat Sanctuary was. And I'm a bird biologist working on the coast every single day, et cetera. So, all right, because I'm in the federal government, I just want to kind of give you that place. I mentioned we're in the Department of Commerce, we're under NOAA, but many folks, if they do know NOAA, they know about the Weather Service. Um, many folks that outdoor enthusiasts constantly go to the weather service for their daily day dependable information. Also within NOAA is the National Marine uh, Fishery Service. So they are for regulatory purposes for both commercial and um, recreational fishing in marine waters. So federal marine waters. And then we also have, it's a grab bag of different really important conversations. We have a marine debris program. Within NOAA, we have a climate program, a, 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 excuse me, a climate program office. We also have a coral reef um, conservation program. And then also under the National Ocean Service, we are the National Marine Sanctuary System. So we're a very different age, or excuse me, office within all of NOAA with the only place-based conversation, meaning like parks and that type of thing. So um, it, it's, it's crazy, lots of, lots of resources. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to keep this as really a more of a federal agency type thing, but I think it's important for people to understand, especially the last, I would say, six or seven months, there's been a lot of really ripe conversations of my theme of like working smarter, not harder. How do we, there's been so many conversations of how do we include or think about, consider more diverse opportunities, more equitable access and experiences? How do we talk about climate resiliency for communities? And so these three things that I, I put on the screen are three federal interagency opportunities for coordination and collaboration. So again, how do we work together so that the public, whether you're living there adjacent to a park place protected area, or you're coming to visit, why should you have to know the difference really between maybe a forest or a park or a sanctuary? How can we collaboratively across the federal agencies make things easier, whether it's infrastructure or working in a community for resilience to climate. Um, so the first one, America the Beautiful, has been around for about a year and a half or so, but underneath that, there is a huge interagency focus on increasing equitable access to nature-deprived communities. The next one, I'll just touch on briefly, similar type conversation, um, it's called FICOR, Federal Interagency Council of Outdoor Recreation, but it's creating really focus on outdoor recreation as a whole. Nature deprived communities are a little bit different, just getting them into nature. The, this FICOR course is focusing on the experience itself, um, whether it's talking through the equity lens or community-based tourism or economic development, climate resilience, the whole gamut focused on outdoor recreation and community-based tourism for the people of the United States of America, generally the public, right? This next one is the National Travel and Tourism Strategy. And these all happened about three months with each other this past year. So it's been a little bit crazy, but really good. 
The national travel and tourism strategy is set out by the Department of Commerce, but again, interagency, with a five-year goal of increasing American jobs by attracting international visitors to the United States. Right? That's a big, and that's why it's under Department of Commerce, right? The big dollars, it's considered export. But here's the thing: if people want to come, when they come internationally to the United States, a lot of cases it might be work, but they might be visiting the Grand Canyon. They might be catching they're huge fish at Florida Keys National Meat Sanctuary are going surfing. So if we don't have healthy waters and equitable opportunities and experiences, whether it's for people that are coming from different countries or for the people living in, in, within the United States, it's the same thing. So there's so much overlap and so many conversations. And that's why working together, why I work strategically with the, both the outdoor recreation sector and the tourism, travel and tourism industry sectors, as well as nonprofits and, and that type of thing, but really trying to focus on those two sectors and trying to bring them together for stewardship opportunities. The mandates with the sanctuary system are these four. Again, mission, resource protection. But we use education outreach. We're in schools with our Ocean Guardian program. Um, we do a ton of research and monitoring by ourselves, but also in cooperation with um, universities as well. And then community engagement. Community engagement is really the core of how we get things done. We have advisory councils. Our process, as I mentioned earlier, is really public focused and oriented, and lots of opportunities for public participation. And it, we value it. We highly value it. Um, and then our priorities, you know, really reflective of both administrative as well as how do we accomplish our mission of resource protection, recreation, tourism. That's why I'm here. That's my portfolio. Tribal indigenous engagement. How do we encourage more of that? How do we do that? Not just at one site, but all of our sites throughout the system. Climate change, unfortunately, in this particular picture, you'll see healthy coral adjacent to a couple of years later of dead corals. Um, and then access, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Those are our four priorities moving forward as we celebrated our 50th anniversary. So this is the next 10 years plus. Um, so most folks that aren't familiar with water, I had the luxury of growing up in, you know, adjacent to the water. This is what they think. Big, black, vast, dark blue, kind of scary. Maybe you grew up during Jaws timeframe when that movie came out and just not sure what's underneath. But people love what they know, right? Conservation through participation. And that's why we, we talk about underwater parks. People understand what a park is. National Marine Sanctuaries, eh, sanctuaries. And a lot of people think that's, you know, you can look, but you can't touch. They're holy places. So, you know, again, bringing people to places through these activities. And I'm going to keep saying, come, repetitively say this, because I learned, I think it was today, someone said, if you haven't heard something 55 times, I don't know why 55, but 55 times, that means it hasn't set in your head yet. So I'm just going to keep saying National Meat, Pla National Meat Sanctuaries are places for engagement through recreation, tourism, for resource protection. And there you go. There, I said it again. So just a different picture in a different way, but really just that that to me and, and how it's changed internally through our destination stewardship strategy has will definitely increase our opportunities for that mission of resource protection. I'm just, you know, unfortunately, I don't have my notes. I think I talked a lot about this, but it really is just these are just all the opportunities within National Marine Sanctuaries. And again, 98% of the collective waters of National Marine Sanctuaries are open to responsible use opportunities like recreation. Now, if we can get all of those people that are doing these things to actually acknowledge and be aware of that they're in a national meat sanctuary, that, that's definitely part of our charge. One of our other tools that we use is every year we have National Get and Shear Sanctuary Week. It's a great opportunity to show the places as, you know, whether it's fishing, diving, snorkeling, et cetera, show these activities and how they're occurring in national meat sanctuaries. So one of the models, um, our business model is also very different than other places. We don't lead tours. We don't have kayaks that we rent. We generally don't on a regular basis. We don't do like how to fish things. We depend on the communities adjacent to us to bring people into our places. So you're probably thinking, okay, so there's no fees, no operator fees. That means we're not, there's really no regulated opportunity for us to know who those operators are, which is good and bad. It's great because they have free access into the National League Sanctuary. It's great for their business and bottom line. But again, where's that opportunity for connecting people to places and infusing the stewardship message of a National League Sanctuary? How are they helping collectively to help the mission protect the resources that they depend on, whether they realize it or not? 
Um, and I'm not saying they don't realize it, but in many cases, we don't know because we're unaware. We're not in connection with them. We're not based in a community. We're in our offices in a business center. We manage water. So it's a, it's a philosophical shift that, shift that we're going through right now, but having opportunities like this, where we are in the communities, we are bringing people to places, we are, to, we are working with these operators to help us provide these opportunities. It's a great opportunity, one, to showcase on social media, because of the last couple of years we do online, as well as like in-person stuff. My preference is in-person, because you can't get wet when you're doing it online. But one of those opportunities, here's that other opportunity, though responsible use programs. So I talked about these operators. One way that we've kind of worked through the toolkit of try, how do we connect with operators? We created a volunteer use program. So in the Florida Keys, specifically for right now, anyhow, we started a program called Blue Star. Blue Star operators in, are it's a volunteer program for diving, fishing, and snorkeling operators to work with us. So we work on messaging together. It's encouraging responsible use and sustainable practices. The tour operators are now the frontline educators and the ambassadors. So they talk to, they provide briefings for people that come on board and pay for them. Things like, hey, when you get off the boat, don't jump on top of the coral reef. The coral reef dies, like basic messaging. And it's reducing visitor use to the resource. We've had studies that show that people that have received these Blue Star operator briefings, is a it's a huge decline in the impact to the coral reefs. So. It's a, hopefully it's something we'll be able to mimic across the system for right now. It's just been really successful in the Florida Keys, National Marine Sanctuary and Blue Star. So if any of you folks online are hearing me, if you're going to Florida Keys, try to find Blue Star operators. They are fantastic folks. And then back to on some wildlife, or excuse me, some online content. It's our wildlife viewing guidelines. Um, it's another way to get in front of people before they come to a National Marine Sanctuary. And the messaging that we created is really very high level. And for folks that are um, more familiar with like wildlife distances and guidelines. So you'll see maybe in some places like it's legally, you can only get within, I'm just throwing this out there, 30 feet within a nesting sea turtle, or you can only be within a hundred yards of a breaching whale. I don't know the differences of distances um, and trying to be respectful for all cultures. Some cases like, oh, it's five bus lanes. Well, in Europe, they don't use as many buses as we do. So we created guidelines that were very high level, like instead of saying you can't get too close, how do we model the positive behavior? So keep your distance. Um, you know, instead of feeding or don't feed or don't feed this or don't touch that, we try to really model those positive behaviors. We have a lot of great content online. Um, it's been really successful. We have a pledge just to keep track of the number of people and trying to encourage others. You can download graphics and social media and all that type. We try to be a little funny too. Like if you see them flap, take a step back. So that's showing you what behaviors to watch out for instead of saying you can only be 10, minute, uh, 10 meters away. So um, that QR code on the bottom left will take you to some of our Spanish pages um, that we've translated for the wildlife viewing. But again, this is another great way of trying to get in front of people because we don't have that single point of entry to, to get in contact with people. And then also our visit pages. So um, more online content. We've we acknowledged that there's tons of shipwrecks with the National Marine Sanctuary System and history buffs love the stories about shipwrecks. But if you're like me, I like to interact. This which is one of the reasons I love Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. At Thunder Bay, you have a maritime heritage trail that you can walk around. So one of those actual land parts, there's a glass bottom boat because the water is so clear. So that bottom left one is a glass bottom boat picture that I took in Thunder Bay. The water's clear if the shipwrecks are fairly shallow, but you can also go diving in some places. You can go kayaking around some of our sites that are the shipwrecks are fairly like above surface. And then we also have for those that don't wanna go in the water or live in Indiana and don't wanna to travel to the ocean, we have virtual dives and experiences as well. So, and our, some of our visitor centers on the top right, Thunder Bay is again, another one that has fantastic exhibits to connect people to places through historical maritime heritage cultural conversations. We also created a business advisory council. Um, in the next four years, they're focusing solely on recreation tourism. And it's a pretty high level industry focus, but also nonprofits in there as well. So folks from Guy Harvey Foundation, Hispanic Access Foundation, all the way to the Viking Cruises and the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. We have 2031 Consulting for Sustainable Tourism, IANTA, et cetera. And we really love to tap into them to provide 
information advise us on how are we doing? Um, it's, it's tough. We're a small, very small agency trying to do a lot of work and trying to make, hopefully create ambassadors out of others to help spread the word is, is definitely helpful for all of us. Another tool we have is part, we try to be part of relevant conversations. So in, instead of creating our own app, we are part of the National Park Trust Park Passport app. It's a fantastic app of just parks in general. Again, blue parks, water parks, that type of thing. You can, no matter where you are in the United States, it's free to download. You can find out your local park. It could be a county park. It could be a state park. It could be a national park. It could be Army Corps of Engineers area, or it could be a national meat sanctuary. You can collect badges, activity badges, as you can see on the top, uh, top right. You can also um, collect, like instead of having your typical paper passport type thing for the national parks, but these are all digital badges. So each one of our national meat sanctuaries, including our two marine national monuments, have a badge for each one of those sites. It's just super easy to use. It brings us back to our content, virtual tours, responsible wildlife, wildlife viewing, and all of that. So it's a great resource. You can share it with your friends if you're into that. Really cool information. But again, we're small but mighty and try to be part of relevant conversations since we don't have that opportunity as much as others do for that, that, that in-person type connection. Um, just another messaging campaign, Recreate Responsibly. If you're not familiar with them and you live in the United States, I highly suggest it's very similar to Leave No Trace, but it's really more for someone who wants to go outside, outside period. You don't have to worry about backcountry. You don't have to worry about like what gear to wear. If you want to walk outside and just get some air, these are just some general guidelines so just be able to do that and feel safe about it. Um, there's water safety guidelines and fire safety. It really happened. It really um, was born out of the beginning of COVID, especially when people were kind of stuck inside and then all of a sudden everybody was going outside. And how do you do that? And how do you be respectful? And no matter where you are and making it better. And then lastly, I just want to touch on this destination stewardship strategy, providing this is our draft. We're, we're very close to final, but this is our draft. So the vision of equitable outdoor experiences in and around National Marine Sanctuaries and that destination approach of bringing in community and the sanctuary system at the same time for the purposes of resource protection. How do we do this in step? So it's mutually beneficial. So one for the economy, but also for protecting the resources. And that's it. I apologize for the bumps in the road in the beginning, but if we don't have time for questions, please reach out to me either via email or you can find me on LinkedIn. Grace, thank you so much. We do actually have some time for questions. So um, I've got, looks like we've got two or three here. The first one I'm going to ask uh, comes from our Whova app. And this question is, how can tourism contribute to the preservation of life below water? Ah, very good. Um, for me, right, that destination stewardship approach. So Tourism, even if you're not going in the water yourself, most folks, I'll use the coast of whatever, pick your destination, beautiful coast, Monterey Bay maybe, you, you might be going there just because it's a beautiful seascape. Um, and if the water below or the critters below are not healthy and die, it's going to impact the top of the surface as well. Um, maybe you're eating fish at a sustainable seafood restaurant in Monterey Bay, again, that means you're depending, that restaurant is depending on a healthy ocean, which is adjacent to the community. So it's so tied. It's just many people just don't think about it because they think about blue water. They think about the sand and the sun, which is all fantastic. But if that ocean was full of like marine debris or cars or die off of all the critters below, that's going to impact the top. And it's definitely going to impact the community adjacent to it. Great, thank you. Um, our next question here is, are U.S. Marine sanctuaries compromised by other countries' illegal fishing operations? And if so, how is NOAA working with other countries to address those concerns? That's a good question. Um, one thing I didn't get a chance to mention, so within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries under NOAA is a Marine Protected Area Center. And it's not a regulatory body, it is a coordination um, office. So across the United States, we are considered, national sanctuaries are considered a type of marine protected area. There are other agencies and other offices and counties and even um, indigenous nations that manage their own type of marine protected area. We help coordinate those conversations. 
we also have an international arm as well as part of that. So we are, like I mentioned earlier, we are part of this global conversation on ocean and marine protected areas. We generally, national marine sanctuaries within the United States, we're pretty well watched. Um, our commercial fishing fleets, our et cetera, Coast Guard and others, we generally do a pretty good job. I said, except for a couple that are way out there, Papahanaumokuakea, Kea, Marine National Monument, it's pretty far out there. Like you need to go be very purposeful <laughs> in going out there. And there have been cases, not as many as in other countries. And we, but we do work with other countries and larger conversations about how do we control that? Because it's one ocean, right? It's just one ocean. It's all connected. Great, thank you for that. Our next question comes from Jim Barbarak. And uh, Jim's question is, Grace, the National Marine Sanctuary System is quite small compared to our wildlife refuge, national park, or national forest systems. With the 30 by 30 America the Beautiful goal embraced by the Biden administration, is there a push to increase the number and total area of sanctuaries? There's always a push. Um, it's a really good question. And if you think back to my earlier slide about the yellow squares, those are four sites that are in the designation process. And I think at least two of them were named specifically within the 30 by 30 goals for, um, for NOAA. And yes, there are a, quite a few more that are, we call them our electronic shelf. They're found on our website. Um, there has been a site in Alaska that's been nominated by a community. There's a site in the Mariana's Trench. And then there's I think those are the only two that are not on our uh, actual like pushing forward. So the four squares, there's Hudson Canyon, National Marine, or excuse me, proposed Hudson Canyon, that's offshore. It's in the, the Atlantic Bight area. So south of Long Island, east of New Jersey. So I'm trying to do my geographic stuff. Um, there is also Lake Ontario, which is in upstate New York in Lake Ontario. Um, oh, Lake Erie is another one. So there's another third one that's not in the designation process, but everything is on our website. So yes, we are trying to do more and it's been a very busy year, but we can't designate a National Marine Sanctuary without it being submitted by a community first. So we're working hard. It's it's It takes time because we want a public process. Right, yeah. great, thank you for that. Uh, the next question here is, um, if you could talk a little bit about how engaging indigenous peoples plays out in the marine sanctuary context, um, if you could maybe speak to that a little bit. Sure. It's different from site to site. It's kind of the, my, my, my theme is like, it really just depends. So I mentioned very briefly about um, our Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. So I can say for certain that the Macaw, Macaw Nation is part of, is one of the trustees within the National Marine Sanctuary. If you look at, and again, I'm a recreation tourism person, but I know a little bit about a lot of things. Chumash, the proposed Chumash National Marine Sanctuary, please, whoever asked that question, please take a look at that. There are parts of, of Chumash heritage that are part of that, have definitely been, been part of proposing that and moving forward with that. Those are two examples, but there really are examples from other sites as well. We are trying to do better, even when we designate a, a, designate a sanctuary, and we are not aware of tribal conversations or activities, we stop and think and like, how do we do better with that? There are people, but how do we draw them into the conversation if they want to? Everyone's welcome, but sometimes it's harder to connect the dots when you're just not aware. And again, it's not NOAA deciding which, like, which site to propose as a sanctuary. So sometimes we have to play catch up and see, but in Alaska, in the Privilofs, and I cannot remember the name of the proposed sanctuary, that is a very native conversation. Um, that was not proposed by the state. It was proposed by the, the peoples that live in the Privilofs. So each site is very, very different. Um, Hawaii is, we try even with our management to, to make sure that we're hiring at least a good mix of folks that are born bred and continue the traditions of, of Hawaiian culture. And then American Samoa, it's the same thing. Like every site is just, it's very, very different. Um, we could always do better. We just hired our very first actual cultural, um, I can't think of the right one, but cultural engagement coordinator for the sanctuary system. We've had a lot of conversations. It was like dual hat roll things, but this is our very first one. She just started about a month ago. So we're hoping to do more. And that includes though, even with tourism and the opportunities that could mean for indigenous communities, tribal communities that want to be part of that conversation. Great, thank you. Our next question is, 
what do you think are the most important differences to consider in communication strategies or interpretation methods to visitors to marine sanctuaries and protected areas versus land-based protected areas? That was a tough question. That's really good. Um, largely, you know, the basic stewardship type messages are going to be kept in mind. Um, and I'd rather not say these are special just for ocean and these are special just for land, because I find that more, the more information people have to process, the harder it is for them actually to remember it and put it into practice. So I would say, I would actually challenge that and say, it is the same general type of stewardship messages. Um, if you're going on your boat, you still have to be prepared and look at the weather. If you're going fishing, we don't want your plastic cups, et cetera, flying off your boat, secure your trash. That's the same if you're going back country on land. Um, you know, you're gonna run into a sea lion versus a bear, but you know, you don't wanna interact with either one of them. It's not a good thing for them or for you. So yes, there's riptides, there's more safety factors I think that are different, but a stewardship approach, some nuances, but generally it's, you know, respect others whether it's on a cultural end of thing or your natural resource, you shouldn't be picking up and taking things again, land or water. So yeah, I haven't thought about that way, but I think it's really, and that's why we created our wildlife viewing guidelines that way. Very high level, very basic, engaging, simple. Yeah, good. Thank you for that. Um, well, let's see, I've got a question, I, you know, as, as I sort of ruminate on this, you know, given the limited resources of the agency, and, and given the, the large amount of territory that you know is underneath its purview, and and the you know presumably hundreds of thousands or millions of people that encounter these protected areas, you mentioned before you know some of the ways that the agency can can leverage some of their efforts are through partners and ambassadors and things like that. And so this is within the realm of information and education does the agency track any of the communication efforts that any of those partners or ambassadors do to somehow maybe at least get an idea of, you know, how many sets of eyeballs or how many clicks or something like that, that you maybe are reaching that way, if that makes sense. <laughs> you need to come to our business advisory council retreat next month. Um, we are, we're doing some, we work with um, WVU, and they tend to come some different things. Like they've been working in the Florida Keys for us and trying to figure out ways to assess visitation. It doesn't always have to be a straight like clicker, count one, two, three, four, five people coming straight in. There's opportunities that I know they interviewed stakeholders and you know how many people do are the businesses see coming in, looking at bed tax and for tourism type conversations, but it has to be piecemealed right now. So again, like even with social media, et cetera, there's not a one-stop shopping approach unless we have a ton of money. And we, we just, we don't, we don't have that. Um, it makes it difficult though, like when we're talking to Congress or others like, hey, so how many people are you really impacting, right? You can't even tell us how many people are there. So it, it makes it a really interesting conversation, but yet we know people are going in. Before a National Mean Sanctuary was created, like, you know, just think about the newer ones, like in Chumash, People are only in that area that they're proposing, people are surfing, they're fishing, they're doing all these things already. And it's not a national Mean sanctuary yet. What a national Mean sanctuary does is one, showcase those opportunities. We get to regulate them a little bit, minimize the impact, but also bring education resources and so many other opportunities. So it's a, like you said, it's a tricky and our, our budget is about the size of Everglades National Park. So funding is always interesting. And so it, it makes sense to collaborate with others. We should be doing that either way though. Great. Well, thank you. Well, Grace, we are at time. I think we've got one more minute left. So I just want to express our thanks on behalf of all of our viewers today and the folks that will be watching this later on. Uh, just a reminder to folks uh, watching us now that uh, the, the videos, we are recording everything. The videos will be available for up to three months afterwards. 